teacher they wanted you to have some type of degree. And coming out of the Navy, I liked working with it enough. The thought was, heck, I like it, and I don't find it that difficult. It would be fun to get other students that like working with their hands and help them and inspire them to do that. Right? So I became a teacher. Uh, also found through chance or whatever, I had an opportunity to teach college before I got that degree. And uh, kind of that was kind of neat teaching older students, not like you guys. So then I went on for that. Uh, what we're doing here, as you've already known, uh, we're going to be talking about chisels and sharpening stuff. Anybody have experience sharpening chisels yet? Some hands on. Anybody have some nice sharp hunting knives? Got any skill with that? Yeah? Good. What's our standard of sharp? How sharp can you get? ideas? Something I use once in a while, not very often. Straight razor. You guys know what they are. Right? You can shave hair with them, that's where you start. For me, a sharp chisel is something that will shave hair. That's what we're aiming for today. All right? What do we know about our steel and our chisels? What do we know about steel? Good steel, bad steel, hard, soft, anything. Somebody give me something. Yes. It's tempered. It's tempered. <coughs> What's that have to do with anything? Hardens it. We can harden our steels. Right? They also have high carbon, low carbon. You heard of that? All right. High carbon steels. A high carbon steel is something that you can harden. Low carbon, you can't, no matter what you do. You can't get a good edge. Uh, classic example, low carbon steel. Somebody give me some ideas if you know it. Wire coat hanger, got the cheapest steel you can find. You could never make, for example, a good scribe out of a coat hanger because it would always get dull. It's always a soft metal. So you got a higher carbon steel. You can harden it, you can temper it, and you can use those two words pretty well interchangeably. And when they're hard, then it will hold an edge, it will wear well. Okay? They also have carbides and that type of stuff. That's where we're talking more exotic. These are all typically a high carbon steel. Okay? These will work. What's the advantage of having a really good edge on the chisel? Cause more blood? <laughs> Could speak. Yeah, I'm not going to test him. He's going to test John. <laughs> no. Um, take, take it this way. Anything that you get out of here that you retain is to your benefit. All right? You may not remember it all, but taking it, holding it, using it will save you down the road. A good sharp chisel, you can do a better quality work, more important in cabinet work than in carpentry, but you can do better quality stuff. You can typically do it faster, safer, less effort. Less effort. Right? Now, you can do a better job cutting yourself with it. 
it happens fast. <laughs> All right. Uh, but even the argument there, a nice clean cut, if you wrap it up, will heal faster than some ugly rip and tear stuff. Been there and done that. Now. Yeah. Right. So sharp is always a good thing. Uh, it also affects the quality of your work. I wanted to get into this a little bit. Uh, how many people have jobs outside of work or around private school? Right? Good deal. Right. So you already know you're in competition with all your coworkers. All right. And even if you get out of that job and move to something better. In, in a very real sense in employment, we're in, in some kind of a competition or a race. We need the job. We need the next job, we need the better job. And in order to do that, the boss has to decide you're the best person for the job. Your quality sells. You do crap work, and I'm the employer, and I need to cut staff, I cut the worst one first. I, I can't use them. That type of a person wastes my money, and I'm paying him by the hour. I can't afford that. Even the guy that's really high quality but a little bit slower, hey, he does it right the first time. Right. So quality tools, good edges, quality work is going to help you keep a job. Get you into management, get you into teaching, whatever you're doing. Right. Our chisels, as far as sharpening them, a couple of steps for them. We got a little off topic there, didn't we? What's hollow ground? You see it in knives all the time. How many of us have hunting knives? Come on. Somebody's got a knife. Sheep knife. I carry Leatherman all the time. Hollow ground. Everybody tell me what that's about? All right. Look at our grinders here. We've got our grindstones. If I take a piece of steel, and I wouldn't do it this way, but I put it up against the grindstone that way, it grinds a curve into my metal. Classic hunting knife, you look at the blade, you look at both sides, even good kitchen knife. Both sides of the blade has that curve to it from the grinder. That's called a hollow grind. All right. We look at this one right now, and it's been touched up a number of times just by grinding an edge. That hollow isn't there anymore. We tend to need that so that we can resharpen it without grinding it every time. There's a certain amount of life on a chisel. We keep grinding, we keep grinding, we, it gets short. We get to a point we can't grind it anymore. I have chisels that belong to my grandfather. He came over in a ship something over 100 years ago. Sailing ship. That's how long ago it was. I've got chisels of his that still have another lifetime left in them because he knew how to grind them and he knew when to grind them. You don't have to grind it every time you sharpen All right? Talking about hollow ground, I've got a sample. Makes it a whole lot easier for you to see. Have you ever seen one of these? This is called a slick. Carpentry guys, you might use these. Anybody ever build a log home? I live in a log home. My wife and I built it. A bunch of friends. Nice. Great. I live, recommend it. Uh, almost feels bulletproof, but I've tested logs. These are about six inches thick, fine, and 308 goes right through it. So it slows them down, but it won't stop. But anyway, slick is used by home builders, like log home builders, for doing heavy work. All right? This is good. It shows us our hollow grind. If we look at that ground area and we move it slightly, you can see how that light moves back and forth on that curvature. All right? And you already know how we can take that on a grindstone, move that back and forth, and get that hollow ground. What comes to you over time 
is the practice to be able to do that well. Some grinders will have a jig. A special little device that you can clamp to your blade, and it might have a slot in the tool rest, and then it fits in there and automatically keeps it square to the wheel as it slides back and forth. You don't always have that option. And if you don't, like, how the heck do I do it without the tool? You're on a job somewhere, you need a sharp chisel, you got to do a careful job, you may not have that special jig. You got it, great. If you don't, there are other ways to do it. Typically what I'll do, I'll use my finger. By eye, you can look at your grinder, think of that spindle going through there. This needs to be 90 degrees to the spindle, right? Especially a smaller one like this, a narrow one, is relatively easy to do. I get that 90 degrees to the spindle. While she's running, I can run my finger against that lower edge of the tool rest, back and forth. And as long as I'm pinching it, my fingers are holding that like a clamp, I can very lightly touch that grindstone and get a nice hollow ground. If I'm not getting it where I want it, I can move it up, I can move it back. These chisels from my grandfather, they're 100 years old, they're still long. Because when he did his grinding, he took off the bare minimum necessary. The more you take off, you're just throwing it away. Right? The tool rest you can angle. If we're going to do the grinding, we angle it, and we can even do this without it running. I can scrape the blade across that stone and look at those scratches and see if the scratches are again across the whole area or not. An easy way to do that and see it, take a magic marker. Put blank black on there. And when you do that scratching, you can look, oh, scratches are high. <coughs> well, then I need to move this up a little bit so the scratches go more uniformly across the whole surface. All right? We mentioned temper earlier. We're grinding. We got all these pretty sparks coming, right? What's that? Pieces of metal. Pieces of metal heating up red hot, flying off. Friction. We got heat there. What's one of the things that tempering doesn't like? Heat. If I get this on here and go back and forth and don't let that cool off, that'll turn pretty blue. All those sparks. This will heat up. If you turn tempered metal blue, that temper has just gone away. Now I can turn it blue and come back with a little bit of sandpaper, take that blue off, they'll never know. But everybody else using this chisel is like, I can't hold an edge on this thing to save my life because the tempering is already gone. In that case, you have to grind it down very carefully beyond that area that you took the temper out of, and then you're back to an area that you can use. All right? So we hold it the right way. We can grind it. we got to watch the heat. Now, great thing to do, have a little cup of water next to you, dip it. Every time you take it off and look at it, dip it. I also make a point of a very light touch on that grindstone. We're not being aggressive here. We don't need to take off a lot of metal. Just a very light touch. And what's happening with that grindstone, as it spins, there's air around it, it's flowing with the wheel. Right? And that air is helping to cool this off. Not much, but by doing that very light touch, that air is helping you get, keep from getting to the top. Same time, while I'm doing that, keep these fingers like clamps, so I've got it located. When I take it off, not only will I look at it, I'll feel it. If I get that thing hot enough that I don't want to touch it, too hot. <coughs> and then you can get a nice hollow ground in. 
Okay. I did this. Uh, I don't know what I did this one. Change the diameter of your stone and change the radius in your hollow run. I may have done this on that belt sand. Any idea why I'd rather use a belt sander than a grinder? Takes off less. Takes off less. Why does it take off less? Less abrasive. I'm not sure if that's quite what I'm looking for. What's the speed on our belt sander? Compared to the speed on our grindstone? One is a whole lot slower. Slower, less friction, less metal removal. You can do as good a job, but you're less likely to burn it. I like burning it. Okay. So you can use something like a belt sand. You can use a disc grinder. There are probably other types of grinders, abrasive machines you can use. Remember that when you get stuck. But be careful because they can bite you. Okay? They can all bite you. You're the most valuable tool in the boss's toolbox. We don't want to damage people. Okay? All right. Let's see about a little bit of grinding. We'll see what else I've got in my bag. I like the tie. Mr. Ulrich here filmed me first day of class, walked my tie to class, and I took it off. I don't like ties. They're woodworking. They tend to choke to death when you get them caught in the machine. So I take it off. You saw me, I looked dressed up. That worked. That's enough of that. Nice to see everybody in uniform wearing jeans. That was one of the nice things about college, I could do that too. Don't let me walk out without my bag or somebody who works me down the hall. <laughs> Tackle me, yeah, better yet. Okay. Stone, talking about grindstone. Anybody got grinders at home? Okay, fine stones, coarse stones, what do you use? Does it matter to you? It's just a stone. Talking friction again. Which one is likely to take more metal off? Coarse belt takes more wood off. You're there playing, okay. But a finer stone has more stone in contact with our metal. More friction. My, my inclination if you're picking stones, something like a medium grit. And then again, you, you, my theory, you tend not to heat it up as much. Having it well dressed is good. We talked about dressing your stones a little bit. Did we get to demonstrate dressing the stones? Oh, fun stuff. We'll do some of that. And then we'll do some hollow grinding, and then we'll do our next step, putting that razor edge on. Okay? Let's see what I've got. I didn't bring a magic marker. Do we have a magic marker somewhere? I probably do. I'll do something that. I'll see what other goodies I've got in my bag. Go and grab one of them. Are we familiar with wet or dry sandpaper, silicon carbide? This stuff you can get up to like 2,000 grit. This is a piece of 600 that I like. That's good stuff to have, and it's a whole lot cheaper than doing something like buying a diamond stone. Industrial diamond, microscopic particles rubbed into that plate. They work well too. You can use them wet or dry. You can use them to sharpen carbide chisels. I don't know if they make carbide chisels. I know you've got carbide router bits. You can use those to touch up carbide. They make carbide chisels for uh, lathe tools. They actually yeah. have a tooth on it. Just a tip on it. Yeah. You can use the diamonds to sharpen those, which are nice because it makes a difference. There's a small diamond stone. I used to carry that around all the time. Because you can just that on a, on a router bit, carbide, touch it right up for you. Another stone, a couple of things to sharpen. Okay. 
safety. We all wear safety glasses when you're working. Just common sense, people. <coughs> I'm doing some work now where I'm working in a wood in a metal shop a couple of days a week. We're doing a lot of grinding, a lot of welding, throwing a lot of dust around. I've had several, let's call them close calls. When a piece of crap gets in my eye, and it takes two or three days to come out, which worries you a lot. Because a piece of steel in there starts to rust and do serious damage, and you're talking one eye left. You get into working, depends upon the shop you work in. You get a big shop, they've got a safety officer, somebody that's keeping their tabs on you, making sure you're doing safety all the time. You get into a little shop, the shop I'm working right now, the boss is my friend. It's him and me and one other guy. It's like safety is optional. You know? OSHA doesn't know that part of the world. It's out in the middle of farm country, kind of like rural here. All right? If I want to keep my eye, that's my job. I'm now going with noise suppressors. Because as I'm getting older, I've already got hearing damage. And now, depending upon what I'm grinding, I put the goggles on over this stuff. All right? Because a couple of close calls with that piece of metal or, or stone, you get a great bracelet blowing around, too. Floating around in your eyes, like, man, I don't know if this is going to get better or not. But take care of yourself. You worry about number one, and the boss can worry more about getting the job done. Okay. I'm going to do a little black. I'm going to see if my tool rest is adjusted the way I want it to be. You can change the angle of that at cutting edge, right? By changing our tool rest. We can get a really, really fine knife edge. What's the downside of that? It doesn't last. It doesn't last because too thin, it's actually brittle. You get a two course, now heck, if you become teachers and you're in a high school program, these kids are just brutal to your tools, make it coarser and it'll last longer, but it may not be quite as sharp. So there is a happy medium in it. Okay, let's see what we've got. It doesn't look bad. Okay, I've just done a scratch it across my black, and it's given me what looks like a vertical white line, which is actually kind of nice because that's telling me this tool rest is already set at the angle that I want it to be. When I go in there to grind, <coughs> it's going to grind from top to bottom of that curve, which is great. Don't have to change it. Shields. You're wearing safety glasses, you're in pretty good shape. Face shields are a good thing. Sometimes they're dirty as sin, you can't see through them to save your life. Anyway, tend to stay then. Some people just push it out of the way and then they'll get real and get the job done. Most of them like to see that. But what you can do without too much trouble is look from the side. And that does a couple of things. It leaves the face shield in place. If that correct stone fractures, and they got big grinds. In fact, I've been working some of the 10 inch stones with big grinds. If that stone fractures while it's spinning, it explodes like a grenade in a vertical plane in that direction. You're already standing to the side safer place for it. Having your buddy standing up behind you looking stupid at it, it's not a good place for it. I've never seen a stone explode. But that's what would happen. So standing to the side isn't too bad. Okay. I should have got my fingers in place before I turned it on. Because again, that can work just like a little clamp for you. And we get it set, and then I can run that finger right along the bottom of that tool rest. While that's slowing down, 
I can sell a good stone. You just got a box lot at auction. What's that? Let you click it. Yeah. You ring it. You ring it. You hang it on something. Boy, that's annoying. <laughs>
stone well dressed. That front surface you're grinding on, nice, square, straight edge, that's what you're looking for. If you're grinding anything on the grinding wheel, don't just put it in the center and wear that out. Move it around so you wear the stone even more. And then it's more useful. crisis and you have to run in and cut something, that will cut. But if we want to do some fine work, now we want to bring up that razor edge. Okay? Wider blades take longer time. That's all that is. So if you're bringing one from home, bring a smaller one, bring a narrower one, learn it on those. Okay, as far as our hollow grind goes, that's been taken care of. Now we want to get to that perfect edge. You're familiar with regular sharpening stones. We've got Arkansas stones. We've got, I'm not sure what you use here. We don't have any stones. Time for Santa Claus to bring you something. Yeah. I'm not Santa Claus though, but okay. That box lot you got at the auction with the grindstones in it, maybe it's got a couple other grindstones in it. They might look like this shape, right? But they're stone, they're gray. They're sort of bellied in the middle. If somebody's there working their chisel down the center forever, they never evenly wore it off. Some of the better stones, they use them for knives, they call them Arkansas stones. Good stuff. But even a stone that has that belly in it, you can use, and you could take something like this diamond stone and water and flatten out a regular stone grindstone. You can redress a grindstone so you can save them. The diamonds are nice though. You get some jobs and you get some quality tools. Diamonds are nice. As far as what we're doing, let's see. Make some more room for the camera. That's bolted. I can move that one. That's bolted fast. <laughs> it would have impressed you if I'd moved it, wouldn't it? Okay. You can put it that way. Heck, you can hold it in the vise. Vice isn't bad, it's not going to be moving around on you. So that's not a bad idea. It tends to get a little bit dirty. <coughs> If you want to use a lubricant with diamonds, I think they normally go with like water. You don't need oil on diamonds, so. My opinion again, if I know the people, you get a boss that says, hey, always use oil on your, use the boss. Okay? According to Erickson, you use water. According to the boss, you do what he says. Our time in the Navy, we had a right way to do things, wrong way to do things, and the Navy way to do that. It's the Navy way. You got a new job to find out what the boss's way is. That's great. Some of these things have rubber feet. That's good too. This is better right now. Okay, what we're looking for is that theoretical perfect edge on there. We can get an edge so fine, and we're talking about sharpening a metal, right? 
figure you guys all have microscopic eyes now. You can zoom in on this and see it. We've got a plane here, we've got a plane here, we've got our cutting edge. We're polishing this steel, we're polishing this steel, and they're coming together. We can get that edge so fine, light won't reflect off of it. One shiny surface, another shiny surface, and where they come together can be that fine that you can't see it with your eye. That's what we're working for. Alright? The way we do it, I will always stone, I'm going to cut myself, I will always stone the back of my, my chisel. Alright? Something this big, I can actually take the stone and do that. And you can see on mine, that shiny area is from stoning. That's all it is. You get a finer stone, you can get a high enough shine, you can see yourself. Right. You get all your chisels sharpened at some point, and you can see these have been done as well. Shine your area toward the surface, toward that cutting edge. That surface, though, what you don't want to do is roll it up. Because that takes that back edge then and rounds it off. So this is always flat. And the other, more obviously, we're going to put it down like so and run it back and forth to get that cutting edge. Now that reason for the hollow grind is to give us a reference. At this edge, we've got the hollow, and we've got this edge. This edge and this edge are going to give us a reference, and I can feel it when that touches. If this is ground perfectly flat, if I take this to the local belt sander and I just go like that, I get more or less a flat surface, but I can't rock this and feel when it touches. That's the purpose of our hull. Okay? With a hollow grind, you decide to, you can push it to sharpen. You can pull it. You can even do a little oscillation. You're going to have to try and figure out what it is you want to do. Figure out which one I just ground. Where that loose over here? smaller one's a little bit easier to handle. I'm going to rock it off the one edge onto the other. Just push it. Now, again, to see what I'm doing, you can do this yourself if you decide to. I'm going to put black over our ground area again. Then our diamond stone will show us what we're taking away. You can obviously see where we're going with it, right? Okay, we've got priming, we've got stonework. We've got one more step after this to get our really fine edge. it down pretty thoroughly, using a lot of the stone, and you can see the areas I'm taking off again. Okay. We can flip it over any time. Because what we're doing now is we are creating a fine burr that's rolling over. When I do this side, there's a burr underneath. It can be microscopic, it rolls this way. When I do the flat, I get the other side and it rolls the other way. We're going to want to take that off. First we do all of our stoning. What do we 
do to keep these things from rusting once we go to all this effort? Or, or wax it. We could oil it or wax it. How many people like oil in their tools? How many people like wax in their tools? Okay, how many people have no clue and don't care? That the rest of you? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Oil is good short term. Got your pants, you can wipe it off and use the tool. Tends to be messy, and over time, it, it actually just blows itself off and doesn't do anything. My inclination, I like to use paste wax. Yellow can, Johnson's paste wax works. Stuff I like better is a brand called Butcher's. You put a little rag in the can, you wipe your chisels, you wipe the bottom of your planes, you wipe your table saw top. That might be sacrilege to this department, I don't know. The table saws, joiners, you wax those, you will feel a difference in how hard it is to push across the saw. Cabinet work, there's debate. Is that wax going to rub off on my wood and affect my finish down the line? My table saw at home, I've got a Delta Unisaw. Uh, I keep that table waxed all the time. And typically, if you're doing cabinet work, you're going to sand that wood again anyway. I have never had an issue where I thought this finishes sloppy because of wax. So I, I don't have a problem. But paste wax works well and it lasts like forever. If you don't use it, it's not going to wear off. Now back side of this that I'm stoning is not wearing evenly. It hasn't been stoned much. It will get to be an even uniform surface. And that's what you want. Top side, you already know how to do that. We've got that burr. Right? You can safely feel a chisel. I taught woodworking to fifth graders. They were doing wooden bowls and wooden spoons. So we had chisels and gouges. And I got all these kids running around. And I'm going to hand them chisels. <coughs> and the first thing they're all going to do is run up to me and say, Mr. Erickson, is this sharp? I don't want to do that. So the first thing I showed them, how to pick up a chisel or a gouge and safely drag your finger this way and feel for a burr. They're not drawing blood. They know what they're doing. And I don't have to sharpen every single one for them. In the case of gouges, we took some of this wet or dry paper, glued it to a wooden dowel, and it now became a slip stone that they could sharpen their own gouges. It cost me, what, 30 cents or something. So then I got my five-year-old or fifth grader sharpening it too. So yeah, I tested. First thing I did picking up a chisel, start feeling the edge. You would say, this one, is there a burr on it? Burr is on this side, right? So we got to take that burr off, and that's how we get to our razor edge. How do we get that burr off? Here, we can start to pass that one around, feel it, and then we'll talk about it. Anybody? No? Yes? Any ideas? Remember that straight <coughs> razor I talked about? I thought about bringing that. Didn't know if that'd be illegal either, walking through school with a straight razor. Mm -hmm. You know, incredibly scary sharp kind of stuff. I just use it for touching up. My beard, by the way, is older than all of you. <laughs> uh, straight razors, you see in the movies, the guys in the barber shop, you know, that guy just before they slit his throat. They have a strop. It's a leather strap they have hanging on the wall and the barber holds the end of it. That strap is a piece of leather and it has an abrasive on it. All right? Uh, buffing wheels, you know what buffing wheels are? You put an abrasive compound, polishing compound on that wheel. You do the same thing on a leather strap. You can use an old belt. Find an old belt, you feel the inside of it, it's kind of rough. Take some polishing compound and you rub it on the belt. Basically a wax, 
with an ultra-fine abrasive in it. And on a buffer, you're just rubbing that abrasive across the metal and polish it up. Right? So if you have a strop, you're good for getting that to razor sharp. If you're teaching somebody else to sharpen, you don't want them shaving hair, because they start drawing blood and then they go, he told me to do this. You can use the chisel and actually use it to bring up curls on your fingernail. All right? If you do that and it's dull, it'll just slip right off. If it's not dull, it will catch. You can just bring up a little curl. If you tend to do that a lot, it might be good to change fingers once in a while. <laughs> So that's a safer way to check. While that chisel's coming around, there are devices like this. All right. We could take this, <laughs> this one big enough. No, oh, that's too big. Smaller chisel than this one. It would fit in there and could be clamped in place. And then with a sharpening stone. You can put it down and have this hold that exact angle for you. And by adjusting it, you can get it perfect. Rather than having to do it, you know, yeah, it feels right. And if you're sliding and you're wobbling, then you're rounding this off. You don't want to round it off. So there are fixtures. This one is older than me. Must be pretty old. But they make new ones as well. Okay. Just drop it. We just want to take that burr off. If I take this and push it on the leather, I'm going to embed it and cut the leather. So all it is is a drag motion. Pull it, flip it over, pull it, pull it, pull it. Now when I feel that, you all felt the burn? When I feel it now, I don't feel any burn. That's all it took. And that takes about a half a dozen strokes. Any burn? Nice and smooth. Almost like feeling the center of a piece of pot of glass. No sharp edges. You're pulling away from it. Right? That burr I wore off. I wasn't holding it dead flat, and I wasn't holding it at the exact angle. So I did kind of wear it off at a slight radius. But it was such a fine amount, I really didn't turn this a whole lot. But uh, yeah. yeah. You can shave hair now. Okay? Darn it, it's not rocket science. But now it would make sense every time you go up to the tool panel to get a chisel. First thing you do is pick it up and peel it, drag that edge. We'll pass this one around again so you can feel how smooth that is. Chisels, I'm sorry, plain blades, you sharpen exactly the same way. Now something else that's nice about plain blades is they're short, right? Carpenters for sure, but even cabinet makers, I got that right, carpenter, cabinet maker. Sometimes it's really handy to have a short chisel. You got a tight corner somewhere. Take the blade out of your plane, you got a short chisel. Not only is it short, it's nice and wide. Right? These are out of a standard, standard Stanley ones we used to make. These, I have a hog, oh, it's got just a tiny bit of hog rind to it. The new ones come in, they don't want them to rust. So I'm handing you a new one. Well, that one I'll sharpen her. This one you can see the, the stoning that I've done to it. Uh, they paint those with some type of a lacquer to keep them from rusting. So if you're going to sharpen it, first thing you got to do is get through all that lacquer. You can sand it off, 
you could use, probably use a wire reel and take that off. Uh, I've got spare blades. Once I've sharpened the chisel, if I'm going to put it away, I'll put tape on. I'll wax it and put tape on. But uh, this one should be sharp. Yeah. But they come in handy, like I said. You need a short chisel for something. And it's also pure bliss to use a nice sharp blade on a plane. This one feel good. So it's got a little bird. I don't know if I stone it. I know I got wax on it. A little bit of grind. Bad. find when you're sharpening something, you look at the grind that you're doing, you get a little bit more on one side than the other, that's where you've been putting your pressure. Shift it. Put your pressure somewhere else, and it come up even. Got it. distinctly see the hollow that's not ground, our cutting edge that's ground, and our reference edge that we lean on as well. So that's what you want to see. Dragon. Feels better. Guys building boats? One more. Okay. This is back. And it's also a whole lot easier to see. Shaving hair. That's gonna look great for a while. <laughs> that tool beside the, the grinder there. This one? Yeah. I, I, you might, I might have been over in the shop next door. But. Perfect question. Well timed. We didn't set it up. What's this tool? Have we ever seen one of these before? Wheel dresser. Wheel dresser. No. All right? Wheel dresser. You come in, some Yahoo's been grinding on your stone and it's all belly in the center. This is what re-grinds, re dresses the stone for you. It takes some pressure, somewhat aggressive with it, all right? This one's bolted down, so I'll dress it. How does it look for condition anyway? I can feel it. The effort on this grindstone has been to the center of it, not toward the edges. And there's this little pocket in there, all right? This is what takes it out. Some of the old textbooks that show you this stuff would suggest you hook this on the edge of your tool rest and slide it back and forth. I've never seen a tool rest in good enough condition you can do that. So we just use those as feet. Tight grip. Right? Hold on to that for me, leave the middle of it. Yeah, hold that and that. I'm talking about a tight grip. I do this. Okay. You shouldn't get it away, or I shouldn't get it away. That's the kind of firm grip you want to have when you're grinding, when you're dressing. Thank you. Good job. All right. I want to be serious about holding on to it. We're putting pressure into this machine. This is a small one. You get big ones, and they have powerful motors. You don't want to grab them. All right. <laughs> I can move if I need to.
see how straight I'm getting. And while I'm doing that, I'm thinking, this wheel is throwing a lot of stone at me. Remember that eye, eye safety deal? You gotta get something in your eye. Heaven forbid. What's the best thing to get in your eye? Not stone. Not even wood. Metal. Steel. They go into the doctors to take that out. They can actually use a magnet and try and get that out. Wood they might not get out. Stone they can't get out. Plastic they can't get out. That they have to go digging for. Okay? So none of that is pretty. Even steel's not all that hot. But, you know, so think of what you're doing. <coughs> Having this binocular vision is kind of nice. You go into teaching, I keep thinking in the schools we ought to have a demonstration. We start passing out gauze eye patches and we tape it over the guys for the day. You walk around with one eye for the day. Like, what happened to you? I took over to the class here and we got to wear this. Might be some impact. But, uh, <coughs> yeah. Picking out how far that bucket is, it's nice to know. You can't do that with one eye. Yeah, it's difficult. Can you explain to them how you can dress a wheel for different, like, radiuses and stuff, too? Yeah. Uh, if you want a curved wheel, we've got the edge square for doing the chisels we're talking about. Um, if, if you have need to shape the edge of a wheel, you can do that. We could roughly do that with this by rounding it off. There is another way to dress wheels. Um, they have industrial diamonds like my, grind, my grindstones, my lapping stones, where they have a handle something like this and a very small tip on it with an industrial diamond. And they use those to shape wheels to custom shapes. Now the example, okay, there is one that's a custom shape. Any idea where we'd use that? So we got two different steps on it, and then this bottom edge is rounded. <coughs> we got shaper bits. Say again? Router bits. Shapers. Shaper cutters. Some shaper cutters, you, you get three separate blades, and you put them all in at the same time but they got to be a custom shape. So they may custom shape something like this to give you that router profile and whatnot. All right. Depending upon how accurate you have to make that, they will use something like the diamond stone we talked about. And worst case, they could freehand shape that by moving it around the wheel and checking it with a pattern. They do make special tools, for example, if I needed exactly a half inch radius on a grindstone, they make a special tool that the tool would turn on. Not a complex piece of hardware, probably all metal, and it would do that repeatedly, accurately. Moving the tool in or out would change the radius. All right, so it can be done. I have a, uh, a machine that's made for sharpening things like end mills and router bits and things like twist, twist drills and it has all kinds of neat little nut knobs and dials and clamps and you can put the tool in there and it will do it. The more complex the shape, probably the more advanced, the more complex, the more expensive the machine set. So that can be done. Uh, they even make a wheel something like this that is kind of a soft rubber with an abrasive that that you can use for deburring things and take the sharp edge off. But, uh, I kind of like what you were looking for. For um, They do have an industry, all kinds of large wheels and small wheels and grindstones. And some of them they use grinding gears. The finest finish 
you can get metal work is going to be a ground finish. Those are the mirror finishes that you see on metal. Unless they buff it, they can get a ground finish and be accurate to fine thousandths of an inch or less. Abrasive compound, heck. We could take that, rub it on a piece of metal long enough, and come up to a shine. Okay. We do our grinding, our hollow grind. Uh, this one, see how small a diameter that roller is? That's going to be a whole different radius in hollow grind than what this would be. Alright? Small chisel, that'd be pretty good. If it's worst case, this is all you've got, that will still work. Given a choice here, if I were using this to sharpen with, you can see by the orientation of the machine, if it's running, the belt is going across the top that way. Then my chisel is set up in a drag mode. Belt is going away from the edge. Unless you want to destroy a belt. If I come in this way and just catch that corner a little bit, you just tore the crap out of your belt and maybe kick the chisel at you and probably screwed up the edge you were working on. So given the choice with this type of a setup, I'd always set it in some type of a drag mode. But belt sanders are nice, again, because they're small, you don't have to overheat it back. Cabinet scrapers. You guys worked with cabinet scrapers. You got those. You know what that is? Yep. Bandsaw blades. High carbon steel. These make great cabinet scrapers. Cut them into whatever you want. Take a grinder, grind your teeth down so you're not sharp. Put them in a vise. Touch them up. Burn them. They work great and they will save you a lot of sandpaper. I recommend those. Actually, I got two of those at home so you guys can make some of these here. I don't know if you run blades this wide. I have one sitting right there. Why oh, there you go. Good deal. Great stuff. The heavier blades, you know, this kind of cut gets you thicker steel. Right? Uh, back edge, I can feel on this just from use is rounded off, which it should be. But, uh, any chance we've got a good fire around here somewhere? Nice guys. Thank you. Don't bleed. <laughs> utility mugs. Utility knife. I get stitches every year oh, yeah. with these guys for utility mugs. <clears throat> well, now we'll have sharp utility knives. Sharp utility. Uh, back edge of our blade uh, is what's been running against the rollers and that band saw, so it's typically rounded off, not very sharp. Nice files. Hard to find good files. High carbon steel, high carbon steel. This one cuts that one. What's that tell us? This might be a better steel, this might be a higher carbon steel, but it's definitely harder than that. Right? So you have different grades of hardness. What impresses me sometimes is think about your kitchen knife at home, right? A nice long kitchen knife, beautiful edge on it, and you can do this with it. You think of a hard steel, not flexible, this is a hard steel. If I took it and smacked it hard enough on the edge of that thing, it'd break it right off. Sometimes you're using a file, you just drop it on the floor and it breaks. This is a hard steel too. 
but the tempering that they mentioned, this has been tempered, so the edges, the teeth are sharp, but the inside of the blade isn't. By being soft in the middle, you can flex, and she doesn't break. That's actually harder to do than tempering this. But anyway, okay. Take the file to it, square it off. I like draw filing a little bit. That's a nice file. It's pulling some nice edges. You do have a burnishing tool you can use. You have these? No, I just have them use like a uh, drill bit or something. Yeah, you can use a drill bit. Sometimes even a file up in this area that doesn't have any file teeth on it, right? But we're doing, this is a nice square edge now. We've got sharp edges here and here. We're going to work that metal with a harder piece of metal to one, smooth it out, because there are file marks down there, bordering on microscopic, but they're there. So we're going to work that down. We're taking metal at the microscopic level and pushing it down. Right now my burnisher is just 90 degrees to the blade. Now once I've got that done well, I'll anchor in a burr, kind of like what we did want in the chisel, is exactly what we did want on the cabinet scraper. And I can turn a burr on the other side. And now I've got two of them. So I can take it out and decide heck even which one I want to use. But it's plainly obvious I got burrs on there. You can try them on the table. You have to strip this one anyway. Typically I'll flex it. You can use it on a round shape, whatever shape you want. If I'm pushing. be 15 minutes worth of sand with a couple of strokes with a cabinet scrape. Now it's also handy to even go so far as to use the burnisher on the end. Because sometimes it's nice to have a corner that you can use to get into. And you can also go so far as to take it to a grinder and if you've got a custom shape, you can grind this blade in the custom shape. Uh, the idea of a fine piece of molding. It's got an inside curve to it. You can grind a radius on this, burnish it, and put it right in there and just scrape it out. Pre finishing a part, something like that. That'll work well. This piece, a little bit long. I'm uncomfortable with something about four or five inches long. Pin snips will often cut these. If you can't do that, you can take it to a metal vise. Put it in there, cut, bend it a couple of times, break it off. But these are, are wonderful. Wonderful scrapes. Pass that around, you can feel the burr we put on. The others, the typical shapes, again, something like this. Uh, classic application was handrails on stairways. Now those are curved in there. You can do the inside corners, you can do outside. Same thing here on handrails. I have, I don't have one of these, but I have one of these. I've got burrs all the way around it. I can use it as a straight, and use inside, outside, however I want to use it. But typically, I'll push or pull, and she does nice work. This one needs a little bit of work yet, but also, I don't know if people always use a file when they start. Sometimes you can touch it up, sometimes you file, and then pull your burr onto it. Questions? Face wax. You take this. Okay. If you're smart, you probably don't assemble them all together because that just works fur and fur. But then, heck, I, my, my workbench isn't fine enough that I can organize these where they don't touch each other. I just touch them off their knees. Uh, drill bit is a good tool for burnishing. This one, 
just a really hard piece of steel to make for the job. Questions? The idea of the wet or dry paper, if you don't have a diamond stone yet, you know, that's, that's on your list. You can use these as your stone. What you need to do is find a flat surface to work from. I have taped a piece of paper like this down to my table saw table. It's a precision flat surface. It's precise enough for what I'm doing. You can also use a piece of window glass because that is pretty darn flat as well. That's the same thing. Might not be a bad idea to take some of the same paper and break the sharp edges off the window glass first, you know, because that'll draw blood easily as well. But that'll work. A uh, piece of flat steel will do the same thing. So you can dedicate something to the job. But this will last a real long time, and heck, it's cheap. You get it clogged up, you can wash it off with some water. So you can use it wet or dry. Nice stuff. Questions? Questions? I was talking to a bunch of people. They give you a lot of flack though, don't they? That's all right. I'm sure you hold your own. <coughs> Anything else here? Okay, we've got some other stones. one that's been dropped. We've got a couple of slip stones working for the gouges. Keep them as dry as you can. Well, I don't know, you use some oil on your slips, you might. Yeah, yeah that's not bad either. Just dry them off in your cup. But something like the diamond <coughs> would reflatten over time, something like this. Lunch time. Lunch time. Yep. And I'm out of battery. Perfect time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.